Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Professor Wang Gangwu, Chairman of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, Professor Kisha Marwani, the Dean of the School. Professor Tommy Ko, uh, the Special Advisor to Ed IPS. Um, Professor Chan Heng Chi, um, the first director of IPS. Um, and Professor, um, well, I think I've finished all the, the dignitaries. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, this happens to be the 25th anniversary of IPS this year. And I am very grateful that almost all our directors are present at this conference, beginning with the first, Professor Chan, and Lee Sao Yen is here, uh, Professor Tommy Ko, who was the director for the longest time, um, uh, Arun Mainan uh, uh, was somewhere here, and uh, um, Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, who will be here in a moment. I'm very grateful that all of us could be here on this auspicious occasion. And let me begin by assuring you that when we fix this day, 20th January 2013, for Singapore Perspectives 2013, uh, we had no idea what would happen on 26th January. <laughs> uh, but as fate would have it, this is the first large scale public interest gathering since that day, thus the full court press uh, in attendance. Be that as it may, the fact is this conference has been in planning for more than a year, being the culmination of a scenario planning exercise that we undertook dubbed IPS PRISM. You have a, a, a leaflet before you describing uh, the project. That exercise, that scenario planning exercise, posed a very simple question. How will we govern ourselves in 2022? In essence, two election cycles from now. When a friend proposed that we undertake this exercise, I was initially skeptical. Unlike in large organizations that use the scenario planning method, the people involved in IPS prison would share little in common with each other aside from their citizenship. Would a group of people who didn't share a similar set of assumptions be able to meet fruitfully on this question, I wondered. My friend, who was very wise, said to me, in this exercise, the process is just as important as the outcome. The mere act of bringing together 140 odd people from a variety of areas, business, civil society, the arts and media, young Singaporeans, new citizens, academia, public service, to consider the most important question that citizens in a representative democracy can ask themselves, namely, how are we to govern ourselves? That act in itself would be productive. Elections, it has been said, are means for peoples in democracies to have conversations among themselves. You all heard the saying, vox populi, vox dei. Sometimes the vox can sound like a bark, but it is speech nevertheless. Well, the scenario planning exercise that we conducted was a conversation about what that conversation would or should turn on. What will be the chief forces shaping our future? How should we arrange ourselves to secure the best outcome for ourselves? If men were angels, no government would be necessary, wrote James Madison in the Federalist Papers. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on governments would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. Humankind has been having this conversation about the conversation for some centuries now. In a humble way, IPS PRISM was a tiny slipstream in that long conversation. Not being angels, how do we govern ourselves? Not being angels, how do we govern the governed? As it turned out, both the process and the outcome were useful. You will hear about both in the third segment of this conference from Dr. Gillian Ko. I should thank her for helming this project from beginning to end. I should thank too Dawn Yip, who drew up the concept paper for PRISM, Jacqueline Wong and Aaron Maniam, 
uh, who are our chief facilitators through the various workshops, and Jason Lowe, Valerie, Ben Ho, Andrew Lim, Serling, and Yi Ying, who all helped in various ways to put this project together. I will only make brief remarks here about the three scenarios. First, what we called singastore.com. You can hear the, the descriptions of each scenario uh, more adequately in the, in, the, in the leaflet that was distributed. Singastore.com, strong government, pro-business, minimal social support. Second, what we call singagives.gov, strong government, extensive social support. And finally, wikicity.sg, weak government, minimal social support, community-based apparatuses. One way to understand the three scenarios will be to make a distinction between the strength and scope of government. Governments, states, can be weak or strong. Also, governments can have a wide or narrow scope. They can do a lot or they can do very little. For example, the United States has a strong government. It can enforce laws effectively and it can conduct wars, prosecute wars around the world. But its scope is relatively narrow compared to, say, the Scandinavian countries with their large cradle-to-grave welfare systems, the US government doesn't provide extensive social support. Single store, the first scenario, is strong government with narrow scope, relatively narrow scope. Singa gives is strong government with extensive scope. It does a lot. Wikicity is weak government with narrow scope. Singaporeans will have to decide what permutation and combination of these various alternatives we want. They may not be necessarily exclusive. It is not as though that each, each, each of the scenario, scenarios is a hermetically ski, sealed package. Though I don't think some combinations are possible. For example, we cannot have a weak government providing extensive scope. But all this is of the future. It might be instructive to pause a while and consider the past. It is worth remembering that the first scenario our founding leaders developed turned out to be totally wrong. What did the seven men who began gathering in the basement dining room of number 38 Oxley Road in 1953, 60 years ago this year, to plan the establishment of the People's Action Party assume was the future of Singapore? They all assumed Singapore had no future, for they thought the island was an inextricable part of Malaya. And they weren't the only ones. The Communist Party of Malaya, too, assumed that Singapore was a part of Malaya. Nobody, not the communists, not the non-communists, not the British, not the Malayans, not Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, hardly anyone assumed that Singapore could exist as a sovereign, independent state. As we now know, they all turned out to be wrong. It is very important to remember this, so easy it is to forget. The chief architects of modern Singapore began with the assumption that Singapore was not viable. They were surprised to become Singaporeans. They all assumed they were something else, Malayan. So remember this thing that is so easy to forget. Our founding fathers got their founding scenario wrong. They tripped over a fantasy, merger with Malaya, and stumbled into reality, independent Singapore. This remembrance is an occasion for humility. We can but spy through a glass darkly, and the best of us often fail in our foresight. We get things wrong. Our founding fathers had better luck with their second scenario. Singapore as a global city. It was Mr. S. Rajaratnam who first gave voice to this scenario as far back as 1973, decades before globalization became a buzzword. It was a piece of remarkable foresight. And if I may indulge myself in, a, uh, in an aside, we have many scenario planning units in Singapore now. Not a single one, as far as I know, has come up with a scenario as powerfully predictive and formative for Singapore 
as Raja Ratnam did that day in 1973 as he banged away at his typewriter, one man smoking goodness knows how many packs of cigarettes, imagining Singapore as a global city. What he foresaw is today a reality. We live by connecting ourselves to a network of other global cities. We have, I suppose, arrived. Or have we? I just want to suggest one thought here. Is it possible that we may have reached the limit of Rajaratnam's vision? Is it possible that we have to readjust our relationship to globalization in order to remain Singapore? Singapore is both a city and a country. There is no other country of a comparable size, no other city of a comparable size anywhere in the world that is also a country. Unlike New York City, we don't have upstate New York. Unlike London, we don't have the home counties. This country is a city. We are a country in a city. What does that mean? Well, it means many things, but among them, it means this. This global city open to the world must also be a village, a haven from the world. All life exists in a particular time and place, here, now, locally, or it cannot exist at all. We can function globally, economically, financially, geopolitically, even intellectually, but we can only live, exist locally. The heartland, as we call it, cannot be at a global crossroad like Shenton Way. Aren't so many of the problems we face today, from housing prices to immigration, from work-life balance, what we call work-life balance, to stressful schools, from the widening income back, gap to emerging social divides, aren't all this a reflection of the fact that we are a global city as well as a country? How can we be both global as well as local, a city as well as a village, cosmopolitan as well as thoroughly Singaporean, and make that difficult combination work as we must. We hear much of a new social compact. I suspect we have to have a new country, city, local, global compact. Finally, the subject today is, as you can see, governance. We will consider it from three perspectives. What we call the residual, borrowing a phrase from Raymond Williams, what we inherit from the past, what persists from the past. And I can't think of a better person than Professor Chan Hing Chi to talk on this subject. Second, the dominant, what exists now. A topic that will, ta that will be tackled by one of Singapore's emerging future leaders, Acting Minister Lawrence Wong. And finally, the emergent, what might exist, where we will hear the responses of three individuals, Mr. Nizama Ismail, Ms. Sylvia Lim, and Mr. Lisa Young to the PRISM scenarios. We will conclude with a special dialogue with Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung. You might be forgiven if you think governance is a matter of institutions and laws, agencies and procedures. It is all this, but it is not only these things. I would leave you with some stanzas from a poem by Longfellow called The Builders. The poem has been something of a mantra for me through the project, entire IPS pro prism. Longfellow here writes of how in ancient times, craftsmen were so diligent that they would take as much care crafting the unseen parts of cathedrals and churches as they would, as they would the seen parts, what you could see. We have to take as much care with the unseen parts of governance call it ideals, values, courage, whatever, as we do the scene. The lines go like this. In the elder days of art, builders wrought with greatest care each minute and unseen part, for the gods see everywhere. Let us do our work as well, both the unseen and the seen. Build the house where the gods, or Singaporeans in this case, may dwell, beautiful, entire, and clean. I hope we have a very fruitful conversation, and I trust we will. Thank you so much.